Okay, I think we can start. A warm welcome from my side. I'm uh, EFI's Assistant Director for Policy Support, and I'm very happy to see you all to attend this event on what do we know about carbon farming in the European forest. We use this event today to launch our new report. You can see the copies here. Um, we have brought some, but we are also uh, will have this report online, so you can also download it from our EFI website. I would like like to give you a brief overview of our event. So right after myself, we will have um, the study presented by Anna Ray and Tommaso Citti, and I will introduce them in a moment. Some of the scientists that participated in the study are also with us, so they're sitting in the room and maybe you had already the possibility to have a chat with them. Following the presentation of the report, we have an exciting panel discussion. Uh, where we will talk about opportunities and challenges of carbon farming in forests with uh, very great uh, participants <coughs> and my colleague Sarah will moderate it. So this will also then be the moment to ask questions from the audience. So let me now quickly introduce our uh, two scientists, Anna Ray. She is a trained plant ecophysiologist with a PhD from Edinburgh University. She's also a senior researcher since 2007 with the uh, prestigious Spanish Scientific Council, focusing mostly on Mediterranean and arid ecosystems in Europe. But she also works on tropical forests, dry tropical forests in Ecuador. Tommaso Citti. He holds a PhD in soil science and climatology from the University of Florence. And uh, he's an associate professor at the University of Tusha, where he works on the understanding the impact of sustainable land management practices on soil. And he's particularly interested uh, um, in the Lulucier sector and also for supporting national ga uh, greenhouse gas inventories and promoting carbon farming practices. Both scientists have a very large um, publication <laughs> record and are really outstanding. They have coordinated the study and I would now like to give the floor to both of you. So good morning everyone, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you to FAI and to Elga particularly for helping us all the way through. I'm going to, to introduce very briefly just the motivation for this. I'm sure you are all very aware, so I will be very brief, and then I will give uh, room to uh, Tommaso, who will tell you the results of the um, report. So just to remind you, I'm going to talk about the motivation, why carbon farming is so important. The, that was after the Paris Agreement in 2015, in which uh, we had huge um, um, challenges on the European Union with the climate law committed itself to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 55% by 2030. So very short time, we are talking about forests in a minute, and to become carbon neutral by 2050. And in order to do so, you rely very strongly on the Lulu sector and forests to do so. So for that, in, um, it has developed this tool, which is carbon farming, that just to remind you, can be defined as any practice or process that can be carried out of at least for at least five years, and that is uh, related to terrestrial or coastal management for the capture of temporary uh, CO2 from the atmosphere into biogenic carbon pools or reduction of greenhouse gases. And it also has other potential benefits, such as, apart from carbon removals, increased climate resilience, we will see in a minute why it's so important, uh, uh, biodiversity preservation, and of course offers an additional income uh, for land managers. So why forests? Well, forests are the main carbon sink. They perform about 90% of photosynthesis, this wonderful process by which they take up CO2 Part of this carbon is respire, and that's the short-term carbon capture. And what we are really interested here is the long-term carbon uptake, which is conditioned by disturbances such as climate change and harvest human interventions that are taking up part of that carbon from the atmosphere. 
So when we look at actually the data, these are very recent from 2022, we can see here sources of CO2, that means CO2 to the atmosphere, and the main carbon sink, which is uh, forest. And this is the reason why they have absorbed more or less about 10% of the fossil fuel emissions in Europe are taken up by forests. So if we look at the, the data, how many forests are in Europe, you know, it's about 40% of the surface area of Europe are forests, and they have actually increased since the year 90s, about 25% as a result of uh, huge reforestation programs after the war, uh, climate change, nitrogen deposition, CO2 in the atmosphere, and has increased. What happens now is that, again, if we look at the data, sources to the atmosphere, and uptake of carbon, sorry, in forest, we can see that from the year 2020, we observe an important decline in the sink capacity of this forest. And the target set up by the European Union is uh, more, and therefore we have to find a way to increase this sink potential of our forest. And this is why uh, we, we are trying to understand the causes of this decline, and it's a mix between natural causes, climate change, so we have an increase in disturbance that they're very well um, um, reported, decrease in climate resilience, this is very important, not just uh, natural disturbances, but also they are less resilient to these disturbances, and therefore we observe a widespread forest dieback. And on the other hand, and here we have more hand, we have management, so there is an increase in wood demand and therefore harvest intensification, of course a reduced afforestation, and forests in Europe are aging, and therefore there is a decline in this carbon sink. So how, how, how can we increase this forest carbon sink? So forest management is our only possibility to do so, and give us an opportunity to, to increase productivity, so carbon uptake from the atmosphere, to improve the resilience, and this is the most important part, I believe, and climate adaptation so that they, they, this decline uh, is reversed, and to improve the, the use of wood products. If we release back to the atmosphere all this uh, stored carbon, then it's not uh, very useful. So with this in mind, the objectives of this report were to try to understand what kind of forest management practices could be used in Europe to increase this sink potential. And uh, uh, we analyze with a review the different practices. We analyze how we can measure it so that we have this, um, this important uh, chapter on uh, measurement challenges, as well as economic and policy aspects to be considered. And then we will have some main conclusions and recommendations. So the key message from this part is just that forest management should be crucial to improve resilience and climate change adaptation. If we want to keep and increase this capacity of, uh, uh, of forest, forest sink capacity. More than 80% of the European for, uh, soils are degraded or, so, or suffer from soil erosion. So preserving and storing that carbon is crucial and should be a priority of these forest management practices. Then it's important to also consider life cycle assessment, not just what we do with this forest, the long term, how we use this wood and uh, the forest practices that include both uh, uh, resilience improvement and the amount uh, of wood should be prioritized. So now I will leave you with the results that Tommaso will present to you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Anna, for your exhaustive uh, introduction and for setting the framework of, uh, of the report. Welcome to the second part of the presentation where we will try to dive a little bit into the, uh, the report, uh, looking at the sustainable practices, how they are compliant with the policy and quality criteria, and uh, which are the challenges related to the implementation of these practices in terms of measurement, and but also in terms of risk and trade-off. For this report, uh, I mean, all the practices, uh, the forestry practices, which is basically the sustainable forestry practices currently used in different parts of, of Europe, we divided Europe in three different uh, climatic regions, uh, boreal, temperate, and Mediterranean one. 
And uh, in each of these regions, of course, we uh, we were looking at, we did an extensive literature research to understand which is the impact of these practices in terms of carbon sequestration, so carbon removed, uh, CO2 removed from the atmosphere and stored in the above ground biomass and soil carbon, particularly in soil carbon, which is an element that is sometimes missing. But uh, let's start with the quality criteria. I mean, the, the practices were analyzed uh, uh, by comparison with the requirement of the quality criteria. Quality, you know, is, a, uh, is an acronym that stands for quantification. Carbon removal needs to be accurately quantified. The additionality, carbon removal activities need to go beyond the common practices. Long-term storage, carbon need to be stored, uh, removed from the atmosphere and stored for at least five years, and then sustainability. So the carbon farming uh, implemented in the fields should deliver also uh, other ecosystem services rather than just carbon sequestration, basically related to the biodiversity, water management improvement, and some other issue related to the soil health. The practices that you can see listed on your left side, uh, those are the common sustainable practices adopted in different parts of Europe, were um, assessed looking at the uh, quality criteria and they were ranked on a scale from one low to three high. What you can see from this graph is basically that almost all the practices have a medium to high rank for the different uh, quality criteria. But what does this mean? If you look at uh, afforestation, which has the high rate for all the criteria, it means that it is a process that can be easily quantified due to the quite good amount of data available to describe the process. Additionality, it stores a huge amount of carbon in the biomass, and then afforestation is performed on cropland and grassland, so you have also a land use change, permanence. If the, if the forest management uh, is established, then there should be no any problem in the permanence of the carbon. Leakage. Leakage can be tricky because, uh, I mean, you don't have leakage if uh, afforestation is performed on abandoned uh, land. But if the um, cropland or the grassland are still active, you could have the displacement of the activity somewhere else. So leakage is something that needs to be uh, carefully considered. For some other practices, you have very high rates for some of the criteria, but for some other, you have low rates. No harvesting with a very low rate for leakage prevention. I mean, when you maintain your carbon stock uh, in your forest, you should also assess the request from the market because otherwise the activities, the harvesting could be shifted elsewhere. Agroforestry, very good rates, but not for quantification. Agroforestry, there are different types of agroforestry systems, uh, silvopastoral, silvoarable, and within this system, there is a, a different set of arrangements. So quantification is very challenging for this type of ecosystem, of a system. But in any case, what you, uh, the point is all the practices, they have some pros and cons that need to be carefully evaluated, particularly taking into consideration the local condition when the practice is implemented. If you look at the impact of the, these practices on the two main pools present in the forest, soil carbon and above ground biomass, we can see that in, uh, for the above ground biomass, uh, there is a positive impact. The soil response is sometimes positive, sometimes null. So it seems quite a good picture, but some consideration has to be done. For instance, above ground biomass, uh, yes, is positive, but the carbon benefits are delivered in most of the cases in the medium term. You need also to consider that most of the practices imply a reduction of the carbon stock where they, when they are implemented. So it takes time to reestablish uh, the stocks and then start to removing carbon from the atmosphere. For the soil carbon pool, uh, a consideration is that most of the forest soil, they have already a good content of soil organic carbon. So it's not so easy to increase it in a very short lapse of time. In, uh, in terms of mitigation potential offered by these practices or system, in the order of forestation, peatland management, and agroforestry are those that are most promising. Let's try to have a, a little bit some insight in, in, in some of these practices. Afforestation is a practice that is uh, quite uh, spread over the three climatic areas that we consider. And uh, as you can see, I mean, 
from the graph, uh, the greenish part uh, represents the biomass, the orange one represents the carbon. And what you can see is simply that biomass, of course, is always positive, increasing, is increasing. But the response of soil carbon is sometimes slightly positive, sometimes slightly negative. In the previous slide, it was positive. But you have situation, okay, you need to consider afforestation is performed on cropland and on grassland. In some areas, for instance, in the boreal region, when you have forest cropland, you lose soil organic carbon. In the temperate region, when you have forest grassland, you lose soil organic carbon. So uh, apart from this, you need also to consider what, that when you are using cropland, you use land that is supposed to produce food. So you could have problem for uh, food production and as a consequence for food security. If you have forest uh, grassland, uh, they are very biodiverse. So in most of the cases, you are going to, be, to lose biodiversity. So it's always a question of defining the objective of the, your, the uh, practice that you want uh, to implement. Considering the huge effort of the, uh, the European Union, the um, forest strategy to 2030, and the huge afforestation plan that is foreseen, there is a very a problem for the limited land availability for this uh, process. And even more, there is a, a lack of genetic, genetic material that needs to be used for these uh, afforestation plants. Let's focus now in one of the, uh, just in one of the region, the Mediterranean area, and you can see are reported four uh, of the practices most commonly used uh, in sustainable system. Again, greenish part represent the biomass, always positive. The response of the soil, the orange bar, is again slightly positive or even negative. But in any case, okay, these are practices that uh, contribute to mitigate climate change, but uh, you don't have always to look at the carbon. Um, you need also to consider all the, uh, the risk and the trade-off. Agroforestry, of course, is obviously enhancing biodiversity and deliver multiple ecosystem services. Carbon sequestration is just one of these. But uh, for implementing agroforestry, you need knowledge. You need knowledge, you need tools, you need specific machinery, and so, and you need also to consider that the yields are reduced uh, in the first year after the conversion. So, you need incentive to let this practice uh, to be spread also in other climatic regions, such as the temperate area, which could be a very good solution due also to the ongoing climate change. There are some other practices, such as the coppice conversion to high forest, that have very uh, a good potentiality for storing carbon in the biomass. But for the soil system, the impact is still not clear, just because there is a lack of data. Species selection is very promising, but again, you need to make some consideration. You can you use fast growing tree species, but not well climate adapted, that can use a huge amount of water, but deliver carbon benefits in very short time, or you use slow growing species, climate adapted, that deliver carbon benefits in the medium term. So again, the objectives are very important. Longer rotation period is also a very good practice, but it needs it needs to be evaluated all, always in a conjunction with the disturbance risks affecting a specific area. Otherwise, you, for instance, in the Mediterranean area, you just leave a, an additional full load in the event of fire. So the analysis that we did uh, allowed us to individuate the main challenges for the implementation of the carbon farming in the forestry sector. For sure, the first is the long and variable time scale. So uh, forest politics sh should be conceived to um, revert the decreasing trend in, trend in forest carbon sink to, met the, to support the um, forest adaptation to climate change. So this implied that in some cases, some measurement could even reduce the amount of stock present in a forest in the short term, but uh, allowing for the resilience of this forest in the long term. The non-permanence of the carbon is uh, another very important point. Carbon can be remitted in the atmosphere very soon. Natural disturbances, fire, pathogen attack, can contribute uh, uh, to fasten this process. So land managers need always to balance the benefits with the risk of the connected to the implementation of a certain area, always considering local conditions and the ongoing climate change, of course. So this can be very variable across different regions in Europe. 
setting baseline and verifying carbon removal is uh, as well very challenging. I mean, there is not uh, yet a clear methodology uh, satellite, um, real measurements in the field, a combination of them. So uh, again, it is not so easy. It's not so easy to determine the stock and even more difficult is to determine the changes in these stocks in a very short lapse of time. Additionality requires proofs of higher emissions in, a, in the absence of the, um, of the carbon farming practice. But even more, the carbon farming practice needs to deliver other ecosystem services. So uh, it should be prioritized the uh, implementation of practices that uh, in provide multiple ecosystem services. Again, methodological problem about carbon, soil carbon, because this report should be basically about soil carbon. Don't forget it. It's biomass, of course, but soil carbon is important and it's very difficult to measure and quantify, particularly the dynamics, again, in such a short uh, term, like the five years proposed. So EBITDA pro hybrid approaches seems to be very promising. So satellite remote sensing combined with the ground truth validation are very promising for this purpose, but uh, let's see in the future what it will happen. So how to move forward in the implementation of the carbon farming? For sure we need to, there are some policies which are a little bit contrasting in some European countries. Uh, payment for ecosystem services uh, are um, provided, for instance, for maintaining the stock. But on the other hand, the Renew Renewable Energy Directive is pushing for more wood to be harvested. Uh, we need to establish clear guidelines for monitoring, reporting and verification that should be easily implemented in the field. They don't have to represent an additional burden for the farmers. And uh, of course, they need to contain well agreed and standard methodologies with uh, transparent guidelines to determine what? The baseline. We still don't know if we will use uh, uh, um, standardized baseline at regional level or a land parcel baseline at farm level. So this should be clarified in the near future. The exact scope of the project uh, should be defined by the methodology itself and not left to the uh, project proponent. Carbon removals, they need to be always uh, determined conservatively, particularly in the case of high uncertainties. When you have high uncertainties in connection with the fact that carbon can be uh, re-emitted, uh, a solution could be, for instance, to adopt dynamic measure, such as the temporal carbon credit that could be verified yearly or every two years and then adjusted. It should be prioritized the market leak prevention with uh, um, rigorous accounting practice that consider also the residual leakage. And finally, in, um, in the National Greenhouse Gas Report Inventory should ma be made visible the contribution of the, of the carbon derived from the voluntary carbon market, from the carbon farming, even to understand the contribution at national level compared to the targets. So, in summary, forests in Europe are aging, so carbon farming represents really a good opportunity to rejuvenate our forest, to increase the resilience of our forest to climate change, and of course also to contribute to the EU target. Many of these measures, of course, require a medium to long time span to deliver carbon benefits. However, most of the co-benefits can be delivered even in a short lapse of time. Again, because it's a real problem, most of the silvicultural <coughs> practices in this case, but however, they suffer from methodological quantification, in particular for the soil organic carbon. So just to conclude, carbon farming is representing an incentive system for land manager to increase the carbon of this forest, but always remember that the success of a practice critically depend of the risk of mean um, of the risk uh, forest risk in which the area where this uh, practice is going to be implemented is occurring and the forest response to climate <coughs> change I would like to take the opportunity to, of course, to acknowledge all the co-authors that contributed to this report, EFI, and in particular the, the trust found uh, countries that uh, allowed us to produce this report. So thanks for your attention.
Thank you very much, Anna and Tommaso, for this uh, short presentation of the report. You will, of course, find more details uh, in the report itself when you um, have the possibility to open it up or download it from our website. But now we would like to continue immediately with our panel uh, discussion. I would, I would like to invite our panelists um, to come to the fore. And um, Sarah Adams, my colleague, um, she is the communication manager in Barcelona, um, will introduce then the panelists to all of you. So can I please ask you to come here, Piotr, Yuri? Thank you very much, Helga, and a very warm welcome to our panelists this morning. Uh, we have a diverse representation from policy, forest managers, business and industry. And I'm delighted to welcome you all here today. First of all, we have Yuri Kracik, who is policy officer at DG Climate of the European Commission in the unit responsible for land, economy and carbon removals. He works on carbon farming certification methodologies, in particular for forests, under the recently adopted EU carbon removal certification regulation. He's also working in co-legislation process of the newly proposed monitoring framework for resilient EU forests, as well as on the implementation of the revised LULU CF regula regulation. Next to him, we have Julie, Julia Grimol, who's team leader at the Institute of Climate Economics and is working on activities in the forest-based sector and on carbon certification topics. She's especially worked on forest and wood climate mitigation drivers, carbon accounting for the LULU CF sector and carbon certification mechanisms at European and French level with the creation of the Label Bar Carbon. Since 2021, she's also a member of the French Economic, Social and Environmental Council in the Economics and Finance Commission. Then we have Piotr Borowski, who's the Executive Director of the European State Forest Association, used to four, since 2012. He graduated from Warsaw Agricultural University and has since held several important positions including working for DG Agriculture and Rural Development of the European Commission, the Polish State Forests, and the Ministry of Environment of Poland, to name just a few of those. And finally, last but not least, we have Margarita, Margarita Michelli, who joined the Confederation of European Paper Industries, CEPI, in 2021. Prior to that, she worked as the EU Public Affairs Officer for several organisations in the forest-based industry sector. In her current role of Forest Policy Manager, she focuses on advocacy on forest-related policies in the field of climate, environment and energy. So a warm welcome to our four panellists this morning. And I would like to describe a little bit how this will work. We're going to have two rounds of questions. Um, I'm going to direct some questions to each of the panellists and they will have some time to um, in, intervene and answer each other um, so that we have some discussion. There'll be two rounds of those questions and then there will be a chance to have some questions from the audience. So I'd warmly welcome you to think about what you would like to ask for them and at the end of our session we'll have some time for that. So with no further ado, we will go to our first round of questions. Um, and at the beginning, we're going to focus on the opportunities for carbon farming in forests, um, seen from these different perspectives, and also consider some of the challenges. Um, so, Yuri, I'd like to start with you, please. And um, with this legislative proposal for a union certification framework for carbon removals, this has been recently agreed. And the Commission is currently working on the carbon farming methodology for certification. So can you explain that framework very briefly? And then secondly, if we consider that there's around 16 million forest owners in Europe, how do we know who they are and how can we reach them? So, Yuri, please. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Very happy to be here today, indeed. Thanks for having me. 
Um, and very happy to say that, yes, indeed, earlier this year, the carbon removal certification regulation was adopted. Um, the regulation sets out um, some core principles of how, the, how cer the certification of carbon removals in the EU will work. And it distinguishes between several types of activities. We have the permanent removals, such as direct air capture and storage, for example. Then we have a whole set of carbon farming activities, which can then further be um, somewhat layered into agriculture, forestry and rewetting of peatlands. And there's a whole um, group of activities related to the carbon, uh, to uh, carbon storage in products. Um, now the regulation sit, sets out some basic, uh, some general principles, such as the quality criteria that have been uh, that have been described already by previous speaker. And I feel like Tommaso almost did a little bit of my job there with that slide. Um, so indeed, the quality criteria it's about quantification, additionality. Um, long-term storage, risk of ma managing risks of reversals, and sustainability, as you rightly pointed out. Um, so quantification, you know, we need to know how much carbon we store with a certain uh, carbon farming uh, activity. Uh, sustainability, very important point, very important point. Um, it's not just about carbon, but it's also about sustainability aspects, about biodiversity, increasing the resilience of our forests or of our land sector in general. I think that was made very clear this morning. I'm very happy for that. Um, so we need to take all that into account when we now, indeed, as you rightly point out, um, prepare the, the actual methodologies, which will be set out in the, in, in the secondary legislation, the so-called delegated act. Now, we cannot do it alone. Of course, we need stakeholders, and then that's why I'm also very happy to be here today. Uh, we engage quite a lot with, uh, with our stakeholders and with forest managers as well. And um, just for the purpose of developing these uh, specific methodologies for different carbon farming activities, the Commission has established an expert group that assists us to prepare these methodologies. Um, this expert group consists of 70, around 70 different entities. So we have member states, but then also we have research, academia, we have NGOs, we have business uh, associations. Um, and uh, of course, we are very happy to hear from them so as to make these methodologies um, as, uh, as, as good as possible and also operational. So because in the methodologies we need to operationalize the principles that our co-legislators have put in the uh, in the basic in the regulation itself so I stop there thank you thank you and uh, it's always very good to have um, people doing part of your job for you so um, thanks to the scientists on that one the the methodology um, implementation it is going to be complicated and and yes great that we have these stakeholders um, so mentioning that I turn now to Peter uh, Piotr Sorry. Um, and for you, Piotr, carbon farming is aimed at enhancing carbon sequestration and storage in forests and soils and generating additional compensation for this. Um, it can present an additional opportunity for income, um, such as payments for environmental services. Um, so do you see, from a state forest perspective, opportunities to take up carbon farming? And then thinking about the challenges, which challenges do you expect to see with this? Yes, uh, indeed. Thank you very much for the question and then uh, good morning to everyone. Um, actually, the question is not easy to, to answer, although I would start with first thing. Uh, you pointed out the word additional income. So then I do believe that the whole concept, which in general should be welcomed, yeah? Be, because it should be the concept of providing certain incentives for land managers or land owners to maybe do better depending on what's, what's, how the land use is being managed today. I, I mean, my experience is purely forestry, so then I'm not a, an expert in agriculture. I don't know what can be done there uh, with so forest soils, with how, how, how the farming is being practiced. But at least, you know, uh, what I hope that still the framework, and then Yuri just said that the, the, the methodology is being developed, that the framework will embed in itself 
the entire concept of sustainable and multifunctional forestry, especially the life cycle of the forest needs to be properly uh, understood and explained and then including there, yeah? So, so uh, there are, uh, there is a lot of, I would say, potential and then probably a lot of hopes. Uh, then a, a bit about challenges. Of course, uh, in this quality criteria, one of the main um, mentioned is additionality. Then when studying the documents already, either the, the legislation or some other documents which are elaborated by the commission or by the experts, uh, there is a reference to what's additional. Yes, I, I mean additional uh, beyond the binding legislation today, either at the member state level or at the uh, EU level. For state forestry, for example, it will be very problematic because we, we have to implement what the legislators impose on us as land managers to do. Uh, that's why uh, to, to prove extra compared to what is uh, required today may be difficult from the point of view of benefiting of this system. Uh, another element is also, you, you, you know, it's very kind of easily um, spoken about a new certification system or maybe including one of the existing. I believe forestry and forest management is one of the sectors or domain which is very well regulated by the law and also we have a lot of certification systems to prove that actually we are sustainable or multifunctional. So, so then administrative burden related to this will be one important factor. Uh, there is also one uh, element related to uh, monitoring and providing the proof of these carbon captured units, which will be rewarded. Mm -hmm. I mean, at least in state forestry, we are not op non operating in a kind of black hole. Yeah, we know very well what we do, where we are. Every basically hectare of forest is managed, uh, is measured, uh, is uh, covered with forest management plan, and according to this, it's managed. Uh, as required by the law or by the by the silvicultural uh, art which is binding in in in, in this or in other uh, country so altogether i believe that also these experts in the expert group i hope that they will consider all these elements while proposing the more technical criteria or or technical methodology how to implement this because the uh, the worst case scenario would be if the whole concept, the whole piece of legislation is failing because it's over um, too heavy administratively or, or, or basically to, to even to apply for these potential incentives would be too difficult. And then last, my last point would be that the incentive as, as the word should be really promoted because I don't believe this should be a part of the regular income. It should be the incentive to the land manager, landowner, to have the change in quality in structure, uh, visible change for the future. Otherwise, it's just money spent and used and forgotten. Thank you. Thank you, Piotr. So really focusing on this additionality aspect here as one of the challenges. And, and maybe, Yuri, I'll come back to you afterwards um, to see how, how you might respond about that. But I think we'll continue with our panel and, and we will come back to you, Yuri, for, the, for this. Um, <clears throat> so now I'd like to turn to Julia. Um, and thinking about the French label bas carbon, which is a carbon certification scheme carried out in France, and you're working with that. Um, how does this certification mechanism work? And what are the challenges that you're facing with that? And then indeed thinking about why do we need certification? Thank you and hello everyone and thank you also for, for having me here, very happy to be here. Um, so the story of the Label Bas Carbon, so the French carbon certification framework started about eight years ago. We had those networks of stakeholders that we host in France, gathering people from the forest-based sector, public administration, uh, researchers, etc. to exchange on climate uh, and forest uh, topic basically and we had this uh, uh, will and in topic of interest from stakeholders of can we give incentives 
groups to, especially with uh, also a lot of private forest owners in France, also public, but mostly coming at first from public uh, private forest owners. Can we can we have incentives and can we be rewarded for uh, storing carbon for climate? I would say compatible practices. And we saw also at the time that there were there were private companies that could be willing to finance this, but they actually needed the impact measurement. They needed to, to measure the carbon, to measure the positive impact and not just have sponsoring. Uh, for, they really wanted to go towards result-based approaches. And so we looked a bit at what was existing and there was not really, there was standard, international standards at the time op operating at the international level, but none of them was really, uh, could be applied to France were really, were really operating in France. So we decided why not create uh, our own tools and certification mechanisms. So there was a project with different types of stakeholders, uh, public and private, the French Ministry for Ecology, uh, to start creating those first methodologies and, and framework at the time. And so that, that's what gave birth to the Label Bas Carbone, which is now uh, state operated by the French Ministry for Ecology, which is, has been working for five years now. And um, we have just a short overview. We have three, we call methodologies covering types of practices like afforestation, restoration of degraded forest after storms, dieback, uh, fires. So that's unfortunately the, the most uh, important one right now. And also most forest management practices like conversion of coppices to high sand forest, for example. And what is to be also noted is that it's still kind of a bottom-up approach. It started from the stakeholders, now it's managed by the ministry, but the methodologies, there are I think around 10 right now, and still others are being uh, proposed by stakeholders. So it's stakeholders gathering to write actually the technical documents with all the quality criteria, basically the same types of what has been discussed for the, the, the CRCF. So additionality, how do we set the baseline, the quantification methods, uh, how do we deal with permanence, etc. And so the stakeholders propose those technical documents and propose it to the ministry and then validates with the help of a scientific and technical committee. So that's a bit how it works today. And there are other forest practices on the table right now, not operating on, uh, for example, um, extension of rotation ages, uh, uneven management also, uh, most also most conservation methodology. Today it's more management. So hopefully we'll have a right range of practices. And maybe I'll stop there and I can go back to some of the lots of challenges and <laughs> to be discussed, but I'm not sure I have time right now. Thank you. Please, um, please do raise them later. Um, I think we will have time for that. And again, I, th I see that the, this, this was created because there was a nationally there was no system in place. So the question maybe then is, do we need to have one for each country? How can this be transferred? Um, is there are there ones that can can be um, spanning? more countries or, you know, so that, that might be something, Yuri, we come back to with you as, as well. Uh, you've got the difficult job <laughs> today. Um, and in the meantime, we will come, finally, we would like to hear the industry point of view. Um, so, Margarita, um, thinking about timber, which does offer great potential, as we've seen from for this last long-lasting last, long storage of carbon dioxide. So in buildings or perhaps in innovative materials like textiles. In this context, how can carbon farming then present an opportunity for industry? And from your point of view, what challenges do you foresee? And do you have concerns about changes in management practices? So this would be for you, Margarita, thank you. Thanks, <clears throat> and thank you for, uh, for the invitation. So two parts, two questions. Uh, first one about the products. So indeed, uh, we know now that the commission will look at um, methodologies for, for certification of carbon uh, storage in long-lived products, construction products. That's not exactly, so we represent pulp and paper industry, so a range of different products. Having said that, we think that promoting, um, for example, timber in construction is a good, it's a boost for the bioeconomy in general. So, uh, because it, bioeconomy is a symbiotic uh, system, you promote wood in construction, but with the byproducts, you can make pulp or even with the thinnings that you need to make, uh, to have the large diameter logs for timber in construction, you can have pulp and, uh, and derived products. So 
it's a good start. Uh, and then, yeah, going into the future, probably uh, there may be opportunities to include in this certification also, for example, carbon, the, the certification of carbon storage in textiles, for example. So, of course, the challenge there is the monitoring of the product pool. It's, uh, it's relatively easier to monitor the, timber, uh, the building stock less to monitor the, the pool uh, of uh, paper-based products or textile bio-based products. But that, that is a good opening. So we think uh, that this is an opportunity for the bioeconomy in general. On the second question, on the challenges for forest management. So um, we don't see carbon farming as a challenge as such, provided that some conditions are met, and I think they were also discussed in the study, which I'm eager to read. <laughs> um, one is, of course, if this model focuses only on the short term sync enhancement and 2030 uh, is short term, mm -hmm. and, and you lose a bit the sight of what happens next, so the sync in the longer term. And also, if you lose the sight of the um, uh, overall climate benefit of forest and forest products, which is the sink, the storage in, in, the, in the forest and in the products and the substitution. So as long as you keep the full picture in mind, we think this is an opportunity. And I think that and then you have to assess the trade offs at local level. So what is makes sense to do in a certain region or, or a certain condition. And then second concern that we have, um, if this becomes uh, a way to offset uh, the emissions in other sectors, so you, you need to have a, a, a um, decreasing uh, trajectory you know, in emissions in the economy. If we see carbon farming and forest as the insurance for that, that is a risk. And that is a risk for climate because we know we have disturbances. And, and also we, we also see that you lose a bit this holistic, multifunctional perspective on forestry, and you also have trade-offs for raw materials, so you have leakage effects. So these are a bit the challenges, but um, yeah, maybe I'll come back to some of those uh, later. Thank you, Margarita. Um, would anybody on the panel like to respond immediately, or perhaps we can, yes, Julia. Maybe on the, this last point, this was uh, something I wanted to precise on the time frame also. Uh, what's been done to France, and I think it's interesting, it's uh, this trade-off between the long-term forest cycle and still the climate targets that are shorter term. And what has been done to France, I'm not saying that's the right uh, answer, but to, to explain it, we uh, account for carbon for 30 years because it's kind of compromise between the overall revolution time frame, uh, which is the, the forest time frame, but we can't promise to anyone, whether it is the regulator for climate policies, whether it is a funder of public or private, we can't promise uh, carbon sequestration in 100 years. To us, it's not credible. This doesn't make sense. It's Nobody can be here to, to verify anything. So we looked for the shorter term, but still have not five years because in forest, especially if it's afforestation, reforestation, you need time for the trees to grow. So five years is not really relevant. But we thought that 30 years was this idea of compromise, but still trying to make sure that you have climate benefits also in the rather short term, so around 2050, 55. Because if you have practices that are going to decrease the carbon sink in the short term, even if it has positive benefit at the end of the century, you can't claim for climate benefits. You can do it for other purposes, but you can't have it in a carbon scheme in a climate policy. So this was also a way to make sure that you don't just look at the long-term perspective, uh, but you also try to have this medium term uh, to make sure that we actually we meet our climate targets. So, yeah, that's just... Thank you, Julia. So balancing the in incentives, looking at the, the medium term as well as the long term. Um, Yuri, maybe does the, the commission, has it considered, or how is it considering this uh, trade-off between the, the medium and longer term um, implications? Uh, thank you, Sarah, for the floor. <clears throat> yeah, and indeed, you raise an important question. Uh, and an important question. Um, so I think, well, what we so first of all the the carbon removal certification uh, regulation is quite clear that we only issue ex post um, units so whatever has been already stored that's what can be certified for um, and then there is a whole set of rules on recertification audits to make sure that the carbon stored is still there so it's we we do have this um, 
um, kind of mechanism in, in, in place. But I would lo also like to react, if you allow me, to a little bit what has been said before by my colleagues. So I think I can agree with many things that have been said, uh, and I think it's quite clear that forests are a very important and will become an even more important part of the EU, EU bioeconomy. I think that's quite clear, and it has been also recognized by the 2040 communication by the, by the European Commission that was uh, supported with an, by an uh, impact assessment. And therefore, the carbon removal certification has been designed in a way that would provide additional business opportunities to land managers, foresters, forest, forest, forest owners, forest managers, managers, basically. But what I think is also very, very important is to, to, to understand and to realize that this is not a completely standalone piece of regulation, but it fits very well into the overall climate policy of the European Union. And most notably, we have the LULUCF regulation that sets out binding targets, as has been pointed out already uh, earlier today. By 2030, we need to get better in, in creating land-based removals. We need to increase our removals by 42 megatons in the EU. And the carbon removal certification mechanism is really an additional tool to, to kind of foster that. And therefore, we need to make a very good link between uh, what we certify under carbon removals in terms of quantification needs to be, we need to make sure that it's reflected then also in the greenhouse gas inventories because we need to be able to track that. Um, and there we keep a very, I think the co-legislators were very clear in the carbon removal certification that we need to um, use, when it comes to quantification, we need to use this integrative approach, what I like to call a hybrid approach using remote sensing modeling and ground-based data. And we need to find a really good balance on, on, on how to do that. Um, the Commission is investing quite a lot actually in Horizon Euro projects uh, to, that bring a lot of research into how that can be done. I'm very happy to say that we have quite a lot of su successful projects out there that are currently doing this research. We are also investing in the um, Copernicus program by the Commission, which uh, it's a satellite-based ba satellite uh, monitoring system of, of, uh, of the land sector in the EU. Um, and uh, and uh, we are also carrying out a, what is called a LULUCF evaluation. So basically there was a public consultation where stakeholders were also invited to provide their views on the, on, on the LULUCF regulation. It's a little bit looking back on how the LULUCF regulation works to give us a better idea of what we can expect then in the post-2030 framework. Thank you very much. Any further responses from the panel or we can move? Yes, Piotr. Thank you. Maybe very quickly um, on, on certain aspects, because Yuri just mentioned that uh, this piece of legislation is a part of the broader process or broader uh, policy uh, agenda related to, to in general, uh, mitigation of climate change impacts yes, and trying to find the solutions. And of course, we as the forest land use are a part of the uh, national economy or a part of uh, policy making. But then uh, everyone, I believe, should remember that we, we have also our limitations. So then we can offer a part of the solution, but we cannot solve the problems. And then I very much agree with Margarita, what she said about offsetting of avoided reduction of emissions by other sectors. And we won't be able to do this in, in, in a short, in a long term. And then regarding also permanence or whether it's longer or shorter term, we forest managers as re are responsible for long-term management of forests, which are to be maintained in as good shape as possible for as long time as possible. They have to be resilient, vital, and healthy. And then I believe also from, from the key, keynote speakers, the author, co-authors of the report, we could see how many different parameters uh, should be considered. On the one hand, we have aging uh, forest ecosystems. On the other hand, there are certain tendencies to, to keep biomass as a growing stock in, 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 in forests. So then, indeed, we need to find a good balance. And uh, I mean, there is probably no a kind of golden uh, solution immediate. However, we need to be 
kind of perceived as a sector with our pros and cons and then potentials, but also limitations. One maybe point uh, I wanted also to refer to the previous um, uh, statement by Yuri because he referred to this sustainability requirement. Mm. And this is also a very important element how we do understand sustainability in forestry and forest management because it has many dimensions that there are, it can be seen from many angles, at least from some documents which I could see uh, probably now on the table of this expert uh, group that sustainability is somehow perceived from, from the uh, angle of what is the sustainability scheme for um, uh, forest biomass in the RED3, Renewable Energy Directive, uh, the, the recent uh, version. I believe it's not the complex and then not the full picture of sustainability which is embedded in that uh, scheme. Thank you. Thank you, Piotr. Very briefly, Yuri, because it is bringing me on very nicely to our next round of questions, but yes. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Uh, just really very briefly. Um, yes, I I think it's important to I think it's important to understand that when we are preparing these certification methodologies, we don't want to um, completely reinvent the wheel, if you if if I may say so. So we take a lot of inspiration on the existing schemes. I think it's also important that the uptake is ensured. However, we need to bear in mind that what we are creating here is an EU certification mechanism. So it needs to work at the level of the entire EU, be it in the north of Finland or south of Spain. And there is a, quite a variety of, of uh, uh, forests. Um, so, of course, we need to take that, um, we need to take that into account. Um, the sustainability mechanism, I would not like to go into too much detail there because it's indeed for the expert group, but um, it's, uh, it's the, the sustainability criteria that Piotr just mentioned is just one of the aspects. And of course, we need to develop that. Uh, we need to develop uh, further. But I would just like to reiterate that th this resilience uh, component is uh, very central to these methodologies because if we don't take care of the resilience, then we might not have anything to manage in a couple of decades. Thank you. Absolutely. And, and uh, you know, the, the resilience element is, it was at the at the heart of the, the report. And I'm very glad to see that it's also at the heart of our, of our discussion now. Um, I would like to now think about scaling up carbon farming, um, attracting investors and owners, so getting this buy-in, um, and then also considering these questions that we've already touched on, like additionality, about permanence, about leakage, without double accounting. So this next round will focus on that, on the scaling up. Um, and, and Julia, I'm going to turn first to you um, to ask you how we can get investors and forest owners to participate at a larger scale, especially if carbon farming shouldn't be used, as we've just mentioned, to offset greenhouse gas emissions. How can we guarantee permanence? And do you have some good examples you can share about this? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the question. Um, maybe three, yeah, three short <laughs> types of answer. I think on the on the investors part, uh, I think what we've uh, we see mostly today is uh, voluntary private funding for now, and that's why I think we expect also at the European level for the first years, uh, especially for now still like. I think still rather much for offsetting purposes. So offsetting at the company level, not at the uh, terrestrial level, like we could get that into maybe the, the question because it's mm -hmm. a bit different uh, uh, way of uh, seeing the, the, the thing. But mostly we have those uh, offsetting uh, purposes. And what we've seen is that there's been this debate on offsetting, uh, whether, yeah, whether it actually prevents company from actually reducing their emissions because they are allowed to offset. So with the debate has shifted a lot in France, but I'm guessing also outside of France to contribution claims. Uh, so I think this is a bit what we've seen in the past years, uh, which is I think pretty good because it allows this kind of defiance and always with the offsetting just terminology. But there's still uh, in terms of amount of volumes of funding, there's still the question, will there be the same amount of funding? Because you don't have those volume targets because company can just say I contributed, but they don't have to buy a certain amount of tons of CO2 or so. There's still this question on how it's going to translate into this voluntary uh, market. Uh, but how to get investors, I would say, so there's this question on the volumes with the contribution claims to so see how it uh, turns out. 
And then it's just, I think, trust and uh, so this clarification of the claims and the trust and on transparency and trust on the criterion. I think that's where the debate that we have on whether it is additional, whether how we get into permanence, etc., is very paramount importance for for bias. And just a quick uh, comments on that today is voluntary, but tomorrow maybe not. There's yeah. all this compliance demand potentially. We have some in France uh, from Apple companies. We can also debate whether it is the right tools to actually get those emitting uh, company stakeholders to reduce their emissions, but maybe we'll keep that for the questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's also the public funding. We should, uh, to, to us, this, those kind of frameworks, methodological frameworks that measure impact, climate impact, could also be uh, used to direct public subsidies, public funds towards uh, result-based uh, approaches and bring some conditionality, I'm not sure if it's a big word here, but uh, to some of the public funds. This is a discussion that we have to. And if I may have one last comment on permanence and then I'll stop there. I'm sorry, there was lots of question <laughs> within your questions. Uh, on permanence, I think, just to say that permanence is always going to be linked to land use. We're always going to have uh, non-permanence risk. We're only going to have uncertainty and we can't never ensure that there's never going to be a fire, a storm, a dieback uh, at, at the stand level. So I think we... We, sh we should try and deal with it because we hear sometimes that if as it's not permanent that whether we should not finance it we should just finance maybe industrial removals or maybe we should finance it but we should not try and bother to measure carbon because anyway it can be remitted uh, at any point and I don't think that's the good way to take I think we have this if we want to finance land use we still have to make the efforts of trying to measure the impact on what we do uh, but we have just to deal with the uncertainty and deal with non-permanence and there are the tools I think to do so there's the buffers that are used widely in the uh, current standards that maybe needs to be better designed to take into account future climate change impact because maybe who with it maybe they're a bit underestimated but I think that's typically a kind of great tool to still manage this uncertainty and not say because there's non-permanence risk then we should uh, take out land use. Thank you, Julia. And, and thank you for bringing us back to the stand level and, and thinking about these risks and disturbances, because yes, indeed, we, we do have to consider um, these important changes and, and the, the potential that might happen despite whatever schemes we put in place. So, um, Piotr, I'd like to come to you um, about how carbon farming relating to making forests more resilient and generating co-benefits that, that has been mentioned already, um, but perhaps you could talk a bit about that. And then if there are other incentives, if there are other incentives beyond economic instruments, which would be interesting. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, also uh, a bit challenging question to me, but then uh, um, maybe, maybe first uh, having quite knowledge about What's being, what's ha what have been practiced in, in, at least on in state forestry uh, part, or and the sure in, in the EU is 30 percent of forest land belongs to the state, mm. is very much meeting actually the requirements and the objectives of this uh, uh, carbon farming. Uh, but then, of course, we also have to be aware that. Uh, you know, to implement even sometimes more than on the regular basis, sophisticated silvicultural methods uh, and measures, you have to have a certain potential. It means well-educated people. It means a delivery from science and forest research. And also you have to have financial means because you have to cover the costs. And then I, I will give you an example. Uh, very often it's being discussed now uh, in terms of these co-benefits, this, this biodiversity impact or, or of logging even um, when we have the um, clear cuts. Uh, we know traditionally foresters that the method to regenerate the forest stand, which is composed of uh, light demanding species like Scots pine, which covers large parts of Europe, especially north eastern part of Europe, requires opening of the canopy. So, so then uh, I visited on the spot a certain presentation how to regenerate Scots pine almost monoculture, almost uh, stand on the dunes and then monoculture because of the particular site conditions, where they demonstrated innovative method of, of kind of approaching regeneration by uh, slow by uh, step by step opening of the canopy. Uh, 
And this is apparently possible, so silviculture today provides enough and especially research and science explanation and uh, g guidance how to do this. But we have to understand, and they, they explained uh, precisely in, on the spot, that the cost of that method is 30 to 40 percent more expensive compared to business as usual. So, you know, this gives us also a certain understanding and reply to the question how we can use it. And then, of course, the potential of, 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 of human brain, of, of science is basically unlimited in longer term. But we have to be also realistic because it, all, all, all this, what we are talking about, whether policies or silvicultural me measures, they need to be uh, implementable on the ground because otherwise we don't have resilient ecosystems. And then I'm sorry to say, to keep forests resilient, it means that you have to have an action on the ground. When you have the development of bark beetle infestation, at least what we know until now, the best method is to go and lock infested trees, take them out immediately for the sake of saving the remaining part of the, uh, of the, of the stand. If that was not done duly or timely, then the results are, I, I, you remember from before a couple of years what happened in Czech Republic, some German lenders, or in other spots of Europe. So, so, so you know, these are the potentials, I believe, also this, this carbon farming can offer as a newly defined concept, although certain measures should be deeply rooted in silviculture we know or we are developing together with research and science communities. And then we have to have enough means usually economic means, but also well-educated uh, specialists implementing them in the field. And this is the guarantee also to deliver our share both to the economic sector, but also to, to, to biodiversity as co-benefit, water restoration of small water retention, for example. It's, it's in a, the entire uh, range of different measures which we've been doing also, I mean, with my, 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 my members, uh, foresters in the field. Mm -hmm. But this requires capacities, yeah? Thank you. Thank you, Piotr. <clears throat> and yes, underlining very much how, how we need to take in, into account um, this, these risks and disturbances again, and this connection between science and practice, and also, of course, to policy. Um, Margarita, I turn to you now. Um, and I would like to ask you how industry can contribute from a circular econ uh, economy perspective. So is it only through increased carbon storage in products or is there, are there other ways for industry to scale up or to help to scale up carbon farming? Thank you. Thank you for the question. And uh, indeed, uh, the, the opportunities in our value chain are multiple. So one, of course, we talked about that is the carbon storage in the product, long lived or uh, medium lived, let's say. Uh, then you have the substitution effect, which will still very much um, <coughs> want to highlight. For example, um, textiles. Uh, it, it's a um, European Forest Institute study that uh, it was again a literature review uh, that showed that textiles have a high substitution potential. For example, but that's part of the equation. Uh, in our industry, especially. We are also looking into technical removals or industrial removals, so biogenic carbon capture uh, and storage or utilization at the plant level. So um, our members are also doing studies about the potential. We, are, we have done one at Euro European level and then also I think in Finland, our members did a similar study. So what's the potential for technical removal at industry level? And then, of course, we are part of the bioeconomy and we are part of uh, the forest-based bioeconomy. So the other element for us, of course, is um, also providing economic viability to sustainable forest management. So, of course, that is the actually that I should have mentioned it first because this is where it all starts. Um, so also our industry is looking into uh, research as well, for example, on climate adaptive species, on uh, genetic improvements, on management of uh, climate risks, because many, many of many of the companies in the paper sector in Italy actually own or manage the forest. So all the challenges that were mentioned by Piotr 
they are also facing that. So it's it's a holistic contribution. We do not look at carbon farming in, in isolation or uh, as a, let's say, as a purpose in itself. We consider it in this broader picture. Thank you, Margarita. And I can hear <clears throat> very clearly that there's a, a, a definite call for more research, which is good news for lots of people in this room um, and beyond. So finally coming to Yuri, um, to think about how carbon farming can be scaled up responsibly after 2030. And we're, we're talking about 2030 now, which is not, not so far away, but we've also been talking here in, in a much more longer term perspective. Um, and how will there be enough opportunities, opportunities in Europe to do this? Um, then thinking about how we ensure additionality and how we avoid this issue of leakage outside of Europe. So we do great things in Europe, but, but what happens to beyond? So final question to Yuri, and then we will have some questions from the audience. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, indeed, you're raising a couple of uh, very important questions. So first of all, um, on the carbon farming potential in Europe, I would say yes, there is a big potential in carbon farming. Um, the 42 million tons of additional removals that we need to create at the EU level in uh, by 2030 that I mentioned earlier does not come out of thin air. It is substantiated by the impact assessment that clearly says that that was the best um, um, policy option to go for. Um, I think it's pretty much clear and also uh, I think also the, um, the IPCC report show, that, show clearly that when we approach, also post-2030, when we approach uh, climate neutrality in 2050, we will always need a certain amount of removals to be climate neutral. There will always be some residual emissions and we will always need some uh, removals. And I think that the land sector uh, creates a lot of potential for that. And therefore, the Commission is investing really a lot into... Um, we, we really want to um, do a good work on, on the methodologies for carbon removals in the, under the certification mechanism, including on forests. Now, when it comes to financing, that has been also uh, pointed out already today. Um, so, very happy to hear about all the potentials in, in, in forest, in, in resilient forest management, also in agroforestry. Um, there are a number of funding opportunities there. For example, the Common Agricultural Policy um, offers great opportunity to do agro agroforestry, also to a certain extent um, action in, in, in forests. Um, state aid rules have been, uh, have been changed in order also to allow action, uh, action in forests. And then on top of that, we also think that we need to raise uh, um, pub private funds and the carbon removal certification has been designed just for that reason to um, try and, and offer uh, forest managers, land managers, also farmers, additional business opportunities, some additional income by doing a good job in their land management uh, and storing more carbon and therefore putting them basically in the center of the EU climate action, which I think is a very good thing. Um, On uh, what's the other reminder? Additionality leakage. Yes, on additionality, it's an important point also of the of the of the quality criteria, um, and we need to set these rules under the um, under the um, uh, specific methodologies. But just to say that, just for the fact that, for example, the LULUCF regulation sets out lays down binding targets at the EU level, but also national targets, does not mean that a certain carbon farming project on ground is not additional. Because the LULUCF, the European, the European legislation, basically just sets out targets, and then it leaves it completely to member states how they envisage to reach those targets. So basically the policy setting, the policy design, policy implementation on how to reach those targets is completely uh, on member state level, where they, you know, uh, include their stakeholders on ground. And I would also like to mention here very briefly, the governance regulation sets out a requirement that member states submit an NECP, a National Energy and Climate Plan, where they look at the land sector in a, I would say, integrated approach, 
looking at all the requirements, be it from the point of view of of um, um, of climate, be it from the point of view of raw materials, of of products, and also energy. And so this tool um, actually offers a good opportunity to look at the land sector in an integrated way, like has been pointed out already today by my colleagues here. Um, however, we have seen that the, 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 the funding opportunities that I have just mentioned, the CAP, state aid and so on, have not really been taken up to the maximum extent possible. So I think there is a lot to be done. There is a lot of, um, there, there are many opportunities, a lot of potential, both in terms of actually storing carbon in the land sector, but also from the point of view of designing good policies and, and funding uh, the land sector. And I stop there. Thank you very much. Um, we've covered a lot of ground and I would really like to give the opportunity um, to people from the audience to raise any additional questions. Um, so we have 10 minutes for this. Um, I can see one already there. I will ask you to um, indicate your name and your organization. And I believe a microphone will be passed to you. So thank you. So the, thank you. Uh, yes, hello, my name is Oliver Frings. I'm also one of the co-authors on the economics part of the report. And I haven't heard much about leakage now. I mean, you ask it, but uh, there was not really an answer to it. And especially for market leakage, I'm really curious how you're trying to, or how, how, do you, how you're aiming to tackle that issue. We'll take that to, to Yuri first of all, and then anyone else on the panel can indicate if they would like to, to respond. So the, the question is going back to this, this leakage issue, the market leakage, and how it's, it's extremely difficult, but how can we uh, try to address it? It's uh, yeah, I agree. It's an uh, it's a very challenging it's a very challenging aspect uh, aspect. I mean, the regulation does say that the the methodologies need to aim to prevent leakage, um, and we will be very happy to hear from from the experts how to how to best do it in a, in a, in an in an elegant and also feasible way. I agree also with the, with my uh, colleagues here that we have been saying that we need to ensure uptake and we need to make these methodologies feasible. So we need to strike the right balance, I think, between making it robust and highly reliable and create high quality removals, but at the same time also ensure this administrative feasibility, I would say, also in terms of costs. So I agree with you, it's a, it's a challenging, it's a challenging uh, aspect to cover, and we will be working with our aspects to see how to best, uh, how to best tackle it. But as I mentioned already, I think at the member, member state level, the NECP is also a very good way to look at these uh, at, at these problem um, challenges at the on the on the national policy level. Yeah, I just wanted to stress it again because I mean we assess the literature also, and there's estimations up to 95% market leakage when you reduce harvesting rates, when you reduce supply of wood. And um, I just wanted to stress this is really important, and also we mentioned that in the report, and we also give some some proposals how to deal with it. Thank you, um, Margarita. Thank you. Just to echo that, of course, uh, from our perspective, this is a, a crucial aspect to take into account. So this, is w this was our wish, if you will, for the entire set of Green Deal policies. Please assess the impact on the raw materials provision and the leakage effects. And uh, it will remain, um, uh, let's say, a request for our sector also going forward. So whatever climate um, or environmental policy you want to design in uh, in Europe, also assess this aspect, because we think that this has been a bit lacking in the previous mandate. So we think it's good also to have this comprehensive view of the bioeconomy and uh, in general, the potential of the forest-based sector. Thank you. It sounds like some more collaboration and further work is needed here. Um, yes. Mendo uh, Gashilnik as Forest and Land Owners Association of Lithuania. Uh, initially, uh, when uh, uh, carbon uh, uh, removal and uh, carbon farming in our framework was designed, it looked like uh, funding or purpose was like also to create voluntary carbon market of Europe. Now, what I hear is that, okay, maybe offsetting is not the best uh, way to go and so on. So what is the real uh, vision of that? Is that will go to 
public funding or will go to carbon market creation. So this is totally different things. Thank you for the question. Um, would anybody like to take that from the panel? Julia? Thank you, Julia. I can start because I, I mentioned this before, and maybe you can uh, complete. I think it's I think it's both. I think for now it's uh, it's private funds and it's voluntary, so it's carbon markets. That's what exists today at international level, also starting in European level. Uh, and for example, in France, we have also public funds targeting basically the same types of practices, for example, restoration of degraded forest, but for now it's two kind of parallel competitive streams of funding for stakeholders. So. Uh, I think today this carbon certification in, is mostly uh, carbon markets. It's just that we saw that public funds, maybe less and less uh, based on the context, but still in France, for example, in the past years, we, we have a lot. And what I meant uh, before when I mentioned also public funds is that there is, I think there's an opportunity also for blended finance on this to try and have something coherent for, for project developers, for forest owners of some framework and impact measurement and try to reach maybe more surfaces, more uh, stakeholders with those blended finance approaches. And in France, we ha we have not, we did not manage. We manage a bit to do it for agriculture, not at all for forestry, where we have this kind of parallel competitive funding, which is a bit confusing for everyone. So it was a bit in that sense that I said is probably something uh, also to, to do, and also with the, the cap funding at term. But I, th I think with the, the stakes, we will need all types of, of funding, but I think short term is mostly uh, carbon markets and maybe compliance uh, carbon markets in medium term, but I'll... Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, as I mentioned, I think we we what we need is a good combination of private and and public funding. And I mentioned a couple of uh, possible funds, such as the Common Agricultural Policy, State Aid, um, also Horizon projects, and so on. But this regulation was specifically designed to also raise some private money, so to basically really give an opportunity to, to those landowners that wish to do so. It's a voluntary framework. Huh? It's not a compliance market, just to be very clear. Um, to give this opportunity to land managers who want to do a good job, to provide them with the additional business opportunities and additional, uh, additional um, streams of income on the market, basically. I would not like to speculate what will... So, for now, it's purely voluntary. Um, it's completely voluntary. It's not, a, it's, not, it's not that a forest manager needs to comply with the certification. If they want to get certified, they need to comply with the certification, obviously, but it's voluntary. Um, and then uh, what happens post-2030, I think that's the decision of the new commission, and let's see how that will evolve. Thank you very much. I know we have another question here. Um, Harold? Uh, thank you, Harold Mauser, European Forest Institute. Uh, there was a very positive spirit on, on carbon credits and carbon farming. I would like to pour a little water into the wine. And my first drop is on this additionality. What is the potential of European forests to additionally store carbon? given the fact that since 70 years they increased their carbon storage already. We more than doubled since 1950 the carbon content in our forests. That benefits climate policy today because that additional carbon is not in the atmosphere, has not to be removed. Uh, so what's the question, what's the potential, the real potential to increase this already highest carbon storage content, given that we have climate change that impacts also on the increment. It's not only disturbances, also increment is going down for all of the main tree species in, in, in Europe, or at least phasing out. So that was the first drop. The second uh, drop is uh, time frame, long and, and short term. There is a trade-off between climate change mitigation and adaptation. EFI presented, I think, eight years ago, a study on climate smart forestry, where we did an, a scenario analysis for the Czech Republic that at that time had this big bark beetle infestation and, and, and the dieback of, of the spruce. And we calculated a, swift, a very, very swift, quick transformation from the spruce forests in the Czech Republic to deciduous forests. And the result was that the carbon sink was going down for 70 years, seven zero years. Is this short, mid or long term? So that's the trade-off between mitigation and adaptation. Because if you don't uh, turn down, turn the spruce in deciduous, you will have spruce, but all the time you will have disturbances. Uh, what is long and what is short term? And my last point is on the, 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 the famous Lulu CF 2030 sink uh, uh, target with 310 million. And you mentioned we have to, to improve by 42 million. 
that was that that was the result when we made the Lulucf revision because we used the average value of 2016 to 2018 forest annual forest sink for the EU. But in the meantime, there were two developments. The sink went down in reality, and there is a reporting gap because every year we have to report to the UNFCCC the whole time series since 1990, and the data have changed for 2016 and 18. So the current gap is not 42 million, it's 82 million uh, tons, and we have only five years to go until, 300, uh, until 2030. So how to manage this bigger gap? Goodness me, Harold. Uh, we, I don't think we've got time to answer all of those points uh, before the end of the session, which is in five minutes. But um, coming down to if anybody on the panel would like to answer briefly on the potential for forests to increase carbon storage in Europe um, on the time frame issue that we did touch on a bit um, or on this Lulu CF revision. If not, we need another one. Helga. Yes, Julia. Okay, maybe I can start on the first element and then you, you complete on the, the other ones. Um, on additionality and the baseline and the capacity to increase, uh, can, can we still increase the sink? I think it really depends on what we call the baseline. And I think that's where we might have different uh, views. Uh, ways. To me, baseline is not a, an average ton of CO2 that you have to go above. It's what would have happened on the, on the, on the land. Uh, without the intervention. So if what, what would have happened on the land is a decrease of carbon sink because there's a dieback, because of, there's a disturbances, then you intervene, you manage, you change the species, whatever needs to be done. And then you measure the difference between those two scenarios. So, and in this case, to me, that's what baseline is. That's what we try and do uh, in France. So it's not necessarily increase in volume, absolute volumes, the sink. It's just make sure that you do better than what would have happened without that interve intervention. And I'm not sure that's uh, what his plan, maybe I, I won't, uh, but this is how we, we dealt with it. And so maybe it, it, overall the, the, the carbon sink will still decrease. That's highly probable based on the, the climate impact that we already see. But we'll manage, we'll try to measure what we can do better mm -hmm. uh, than this uh, business as usual scenario if we do nothing, basically. Yep. that's. Thank you, Julia. And um, Yuri? Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I, what I would like to add here is like, so um, on your point that forests are saturated and so on, um, I don't think that the, the, so the commission's proposal, the car carbon removal certification framework is not to say that we need to completely, you know, uh, go out of our forests and leave them there and, and have them grow. We, what we want to incentivize is an also active active management, as I think Julia uh, uh, said now. So potentially um, introducing new species, new species, uh, selective felling, for example. You take a t you chop down a tree, you take it out, you create a harvested wood product. Ideally, you make more room in the forest to grow more removals. I mean, it's it should be an active management. It's not to say that we want to completely. Uh, fence off our forest and just have removals there. Uh, on the Lulucf 42 megatons, I would like to make uh, it very clear that 42 ad megatons additional removals that we need to achieve under 2030, which I agree is around the corner, is an absolute target. So it doesn't change with the changes in the inventories. But you rightly point out that our gap is bigger than that. Um, which is also which was also found out in one of our LULUCF implementation reports earlier earlier this year, uh, and that is for the simple reason that the removals are decreasing. And why is that? It's due to the lack of policies at the member state level. We have seen that also in the NECP's National Energy and Climate Plan plans. Um, we have there is a clear lack of additional measures in, in the land sector. There's a clear lack of funding in the land sector and without additional policies and without uh, clear, uh, I would say, flow into the land sector, it's difficult to, it's difficult to, um, it's difficult to basically expect that the target will fulfill itself on its own. Thank you, uh, Yuri. And Peter does, Piotr does want to have one final yes, uh, word here. Sorry for this, but then I, I think I, I, I would like to add on this, especially the, the last aspect. Uh, sorry for this. I mean, I do believe that those who set the policy targets have to be really realistic. And then I will tell you why. You can even have this 
42 million uh, tons of additional removals by 2030. But in fact, in my home country, they report that due to the three or even four consecutive droughts over the uh, last couple of years, uh, the productivity of forests decreased by 30%. The country won't be meeting the target because it was too much betting on what forests can deliver. And then now I think we go around uh, EU and then we can hear Austria's forests are turning into sinks, German forests maybe, Finnish forests into sinks. So then, you, you know, the policy can go uh, to the sky with the targets, but then who's going to deliver? And then I believe that if we continue with the gap and then it's way to nowhere. Thank you. I see many people still wanting to come on. We don't, I'm sorry, we don't have time, but we can have a moment after we stop talking that, you, that we can continue the conversation because I do want to thank very uh, warmly our wonderful panel today. Thank you for your contribution. <laughs> and I must hand back to Helga for the closing words. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you very much, uh, dear panelists. I really think, uh, uh, um, if I, I can say this for all of us, uh, I deeply enjoyed the panel discussion, especially that it was so lively and that uh, you addressed so many aspects. I learned a lot during this panel conversation. And I would also like to thank again our authors for presenting the study. Uh, I have prepared extensive conclusions um, for this, but uh, I thought uh, actually now listening to all of you, uh, it would be too incomplex uh, to conclude with my conclusions uh, in that way. So I would do it, like to do it in another way, like uh, creating free hashtags. Um, so my first hashtag would be permanence includes risk management. My second one would be finance from diversified funds. And my third one would be uptake and trust by land managers and uh, forest managers uh, is needed for this carbon farming. With this, I would like to thank you all for participating in this exciting event. And I would like to um, wish you a wonderful continuation of your day. But before you leave, um, we have quite some food left over and I hate uh, uh, food waste. So if you would like to take something away for your lunch or maybe the coffee break, you're very welcome to do so, uh, so that we avoid uh, food waste. Uh, the, the remaining food will be taken care. We will uh, actually give it to a charity organization. Thank you so much for coming and 